But let's just jump right in. Um, what, Roger, to your mind, is the problem with moral relativism? Well, <clears throat> there is an intellectual problem as to what it is. What, just what does a moral relativist believe? Um, you know, uh, he obviously believes that moral judgments do not have any kind of absolute force. But um, what follows from that? Are they relative to, to something? If so, to what are they relative? That's one problem. Um, and there's a huge discussion in the literature about this, very inconclusive discussion. But the real problem is what it means to ordinary people who don't, do, who don't have the philosophical training and the philosophical inclinations that some of us have, who nevertheless hear this expression, moral relativism. They hear phrases like, it's all relative, um, or that there are no absolute values, or that um, any judgment that you make is your judgment from your point of view. There's no objective point of view, and so on. These are all garbled versions of, a ve of philosophical positions, but they are very influential on ordinary people, uh, and have given rise to the to the feeling that really in the end there is no there is no point outside the individual's own perspective from which he can be judged he can only be judged from within his own perspective in terms of his own desires ambitions aims and so on and um, which means that judgment becomes a kind of Im impertinence right. you know, uh, and uh, uh, and as a result, of course, people cease to share any conception that they are uh, uh, joined in a, in a common enterprise. Right. Uh, maybe in, uh, in just a few sentences, uh, what exactly is moral relativism? And, and maybe you can put it in sort of layman's terms. And what's been its unique contribution uh, to Western thought? Well. I would say that, um, in layman's terms, a moral relativist is somebody who believes that a moral judgment is the expression of the subjective opinion of a particular person and that it cannot be ev evaluated from any other position than his own. Mm -hmm. So everything, every judgment is relative to the interests and position of the person who makes it. So that in the end, there is no position that we're outside the individual from which he can be judged. Right. So, so then uh, maybe an older view of, of, of thinking or philosophy or of approaching life uh, would have been an endeavor to discover truth or well, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. one contrast with this is the religious worldview, which says that there is a position outside the individual's interests right. from which he is judged. That is the position occupied by God, who, uh, um, as it were, provides that overview, systematic overview of all our desires and all our aims, and is in a position to judge us. We can then, by, as it were, discovering what his position is, come to an objective view of our own situation. Right. Uh, and uh, obviously, the obvious thing to say about moral relativism is that it's what is left when the religious worldview collapses. And that's perhaps one reason why it is so prevalent now. Right. Do, do you have to have, a, though, a religious worldview? Would, have, um, would an Aristotle have viewed it that way? Uh, do, do you necessarily need to be religious to, to recognize that truth might exist and, and, and it would be worthwhile to discover what that is? No, you don't. Uh, and of course, that has been one of the efforts of philosophy down the centuries. Aristotle is only one example. Kant is another. Uh, the effort of, to produce a fulcrum on which our worldview can, can turn, which is not simply our individual desires. And um, I think for a long time after the Enlightenment, Western uh, intellectuals believed that they had discovered that in the, the idea of morality put forward by Kant, or perhaps some, ver some version that was downstream from that, like the utilitarianism of, the, uh, of John Stuart Mill and so on, which gave, gave a, a secular grounding 
to a shared moral position, right. which would not be the position of any particular person, but the position of all of us. And from that, we could come to conclusions about what was right and wrong, which didn't privilege the individual and his desires. But of course, I think it's, um, there's been an increasing, during the 20th century, an increasing despair that that project was possible. Right. Uh, and um, this despair had many forms, but one of the most important from the point of view of rhetoric was the existentialist position of people like Sartre. Um, Sartre said, uh, he argued that there is no position uh, from which I can be judged except my own. Uh, so that the only thing that can authenticate my moral judgments is my choice that those are my judgments. Right. So the difference between a, a moral and an immoral person on Sartre's view is simply that the moral person is somebody who wills his own desires uh, as, as commitments, whereas the, the immoral person is someone who just has those desires. So on that view, you, the, 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 you know, the, the authentic existentialist rapist is the one who you should praise, not the person who simply is tempted by his sexual appetites. Right. So there's this subjective understanding of truth where I can't necessarily judge uh, your value system or whatever else. We're told that this has led to an age of, of toleration, uh, and, and yet a, a lot of those folks who espouse, I think, a, uh, maybe a postmodern moral relativist view, uh, use the words ought and should and must um, mm. quite a bit. So how do we arrive at that, sort of a didactic uh, moral relativism? It's a very uh, good question that um, it is obviously a part of human nature to affirm ourselves through moral judgments. And when people t uh, adopt the view that all moral judgments are relative or subjective, um, they turn that into an objective morality too. Uh, th so it becomes a kind of sin to be other than a relativist. You know, some, uh, and you see this happening, especially in things like the European Court of Human Rights, where it, it, when you, fi you find people with old-fashioned objective systems of values constantly being uh, uh, called before the judges and reproached for the fact that they are discriminating against people who don't share their values. Right, so it becomes ever more difficult to retain those old-fashioned objective views of what morality is without being condemned on moral grounds for having those views. Uh, so that subjective, a kind of subjectivism becomes a, a moral norm. So it's not that people have really given up on the idea of objective morality, it's that they're making a, a certain kind of subjectivity into an objective morality. It's a kind of par paradox, uh, and you see this paradox already in Nietzsche, uh, and people like that who, who um, Nietzsche affirmed this, some, something like a, a subjectivist view of morality, that, that what matters, he says, is, uh, is to will your own desire as a law. You know, it's your own desire and the will to power that is expressed through it. That's the essence of the moral position. But of course, the, uh, Nietzsche very quickly turned that from a doctrine of liberation into a doctrine of condemnation. Condemnation of all the people who couldn't live in that way and needed the support of an objective framework. Right. Uh, and I think you're finding that happening now in the, the kind of moralism that surrounds the European enterprise. Uh, I, I suspect that what this becomes obscure because very often modern moralism clothes itself in the concept of a human right. You know, uh, the, the idea of, of universal human rights is an, a, a sort of political expression of the 18th century Enlightenment morality, especially uh, um, um, it grows out of Locke and, and out of Kant. Uh, and it is what we have retained in the modern world of that noble effort to construct an objective morality without God. 
Right. You know, uh, and uh, this morality had the form of a respect for uni universal human rights that we all possess by virtue of our human nature and which uh, we can affirm uh, against each other, we can lay claim to them uh, and expect others to acknowledge that claim. Yeah, so it gives mm. a, a fulcrum outside the individual desire on which the issue can be turned. But um, it all went terribly wrong, in my view, uh, after the Second World War, when people um, lost any sight of what the, the list of human rights consisted of. Uh, originally, in people like Locke, and, and also in Kant, human rights are fundamentally negative things. You know, a right not to be interfered with, not to have your life taken away, not to have your freedom taken away not to have your property taken away, and so on. And these would have been ideas that the, the American founding yes, would have been rooted in. Yes, essentially liberal ideas. Right. Uh, uh, and we, it's a sort of axiom of that way of thinking that your right is my duty. So if you have a right, I have a duty towards you to respect it. If your right is simply not to be interfered with, it's easy for me to fulfill that duty. Mm -hmm. I don't interfere with you, I don't kill you, take your property, um, uh, enslave you and so on. But uh, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War, all kinds of new rights came into existence, or, or they didn't come into existence, they were postulated by the, um, the process that then was uh, initiated, including the, the right to uh, have a, a job, the right to have security of home life, the mm. right to, um, to have uh, sufficient to cover the basic needs of, uh, of existence, the, the right to health care and so on. And gradually these, these, this list of rights expanded. These are not freedoms but claims. They're very different. They're, uh, it's not a, a freedom to go about your business undisturbed, but a claim that people are given and against that, each other. And that claim other. is rooted in, in what? A, a communal desire for... <laughs> well, at the time, it, it, it was part of the whole move towards a more socialist conception of the state. Yeah. Um, because once you make these claims, if you hold on to the axiom that, that my right is somebody else's duty, you automatically have to answer the question, well, whose is the duty to provide? Right. And, of course, it's not the duty of any particular person. It becomes the duty of society, which is another name for the state. Right. And so it led to massive expansion of the state's uh, embeddedness in human mm -hmm. relations. Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is, of course, part of the disputes in politics to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's one of the things which separated liberals from, from socialists. But I irrespective of whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, it, it clearly involves a, a, a radical change in our conception of what a right is. A right becomes a claim that we can each make against each other. Right. Uh, and um, uh, of course, then uh, it, this tends to undermine people's sense that there really is any objective authority to the idea of a right. When somebody comes along and says you know, to me that he has a certain claim of, against me, even though there is no relationship, I, think, I tend to think of that as nonsense. And so there, there's a, this confusion about the idea of human rights means that there's a considerable amount of nonsense embedded in our legal systems. Right. In a political order uh, sort of founded on this, on this idea, uh, where rights are, are sort of uh, dictated or, or coming from the state, if you feel like you're a victim of nonsense, what can you appeal to? Um, it's a very good question. And people, there's, let, let, let me give you an interesting case. Uh, in, in my country, we have a, a very important tradition of planning law, mm. which was, um, arose from between the wars, but was uh, solidified after the Second World War, according to which you cannot build 
houses in the countryside, mm -hmm. not, without, not without very special permission, because people valued the countryside. In, we're, in, as you know, an overcrowded little island, and um, wanted to preserve it. Uh, and this law creates certain um, duties on the part of the citizen to obviously to, to obey it, not to, not to build just anywhere, anyhow. And people accepted it as a piece of legislation. It doesn't talk about anybody's rights. It just talks about uh, uh, you know, what, what, what duties are under the law. But then um, uh, Irish travelers enjoying freedom of movement under the European Union mm -hmm. laws come and settle in our countryside um, with their caravans scraping away the topsoil, putting down concrete, and littering the place with these, um, what to you Americans would call trailer parks. Right. And um, then, of course, this is against the law. Uh, but um, they appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, saying that we have a right, as an ethnic minority, to live in our traditional way. Um, and this is our traditional way. Um, now, if the, if the court upholds that judgment and says that they do have a right, then all other interests are cancelled by it, because a right is a non-negotiable privilege. Right. Uh, whereas the, the, local, the neighbours of these people just have uh, um, uh, whatever ordinary legislative uh, rights and duties are, uh, have been laid down. So, um, the result is that, that this law is no longer applicable. Uh, it, w this isn't me, is it? No. Um, <laughs> the, um, what, one thing that happens as a result of that, of course, is that uh, uh, is social tension. Right. Uh, um, indeed, we've ha already had a couple of murders in, in uh, one of these camps as a result of this. You know, people, most people don't accept the fact that they, having obeyed the law to maintain the beautiful environment in which they were, uh, can see it just taken away from them by people who, who, can, who don't have to obey the law because they can uh, overreach it through these right. international courts. But increasingly that is happening, that overreaching of the law through the doctrine of human rights and through these claims that people make, mm -hmm. claims to lifestyle uh, and so on. Uh, and, um, so you're suggesting that there really is nothing to a a appeal uh, once you reach a certain state? Well, this is, a, this is a technical problem, but in our law, and I think in all laws, if something is a, a right attaching to an individual, then that's it. Right. The, the, the judge is obliged to grant it. Okay. There can be conflicts of rights, right. but you see the neighbors of the travelers, in the case I'm considering, didn't have any rights in the matter. Right. They just had interests. Right. So the court uh, had no way of judging in their favor. Sure. But often laws are made um, with interest in mind. Oh yes, right. and that's the whole purpose of legislation, right. that it tries to take all the interests into consideration and find a, 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 an acceptable compromise solution. Right. And that's only one example that I took, but there, there, there are plenty that are much more relevant perhaps to life in this part of the world. Um, although I suspect uh, you, uh, you know, the European Court of Human Rights will certainly upset relations between Hungarians and Roma in this country mm -hmm. uh, by over, overriding settled ways of dealing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might, you, know, you might have the same sort of problem. But more important are things like the conflict that arises between the Catholic worldview and the world, this new concept of human rights. Mm -hmm. Catholics have always said, you know, we were the true originators of the human right idea. Look at St. Thomas, it's all there, the concept of natural law. And, and we uphold human rights, and, and that we believe indeed that there is this universal jurisdiction which is God's. But these rights are, are not for us to determine according to political criteria or c according to the, the, the desires of people in secular society, they are eternal. 
So, you know, for instance, uh, although there is a right to life, the Roman Catholic would say that right attaches to the unborn too, you know, uh, to, the, to the child in the womb. Uh, and the European Court of Human Rights would say no, uh, because uh, that, um, that interferes with the right to abortion. That uh, that we will uh, that we guarantee because it's part of the what is offered uh, to uh, by way of uh, settling disputes in a secular society. Right. So uh, the po the Polish um, government has had to confront this, and I'm not sure that it's resolved it yet as right. to whether it can change whether it's going to change its law on abortion or not. Right. So you seem to be suggesting that um, you know the phrase "different strokes for different folks" sounds all well and good, but in fact, when you have such maybe radically different ideas about uh, justice and, and life and, and truth, and you have to build a society or, or live and make laws, um, have neighbors, that it actually it can be an impediment and, and may actually not lead to toleration? Well, the, the, yeah, we got off the concept top, topic of toleration. Uh, the influence of moral relativism uh, is to say that, you know, uh, it's intolerant to ha to make judgments at all. Right. You know, this is what uh, we find often said in my country that um, someone being judgmental uh, is committing the primary moral fault. Right. You know, um, and real toleration means not discriminating at all against any uh, against rival views, accepting all views as uh, as um, equally valid. But actually, toleration means the opposite of that. Toleration means accepting what you don't approve of, mm -hmm. accepting what you do disagree with. Uh, and um, our tradition in, in, in England of toleration, from which grew up in the 17th century, was a solution to radical conflict. Um, uh, it was, p people learned to be tolerant precisely of the things that they really hated. Uh, not, learning not to hate them means not tolerating at all because right. there's nothing to tolerate. Right. Uh, and this is a very important uh, a virtue in this case, to uh, toleration, but it depends upon having objective moral values. Right. So in that sense, uh, toleration, the way we might understand it today, is actually quite a bit different than maybe the Christian concept of brotherly love or, or the golden rule. Yes, and I, uh, I mean, the, the Christian concept of, of brotherly love uh, means um, loving the sinner and hating the sin, right. uh, and I mean that's a very different conception uh, um, from the the modern version, which is more like uh, loving the sin and not regarding it as one. Right. Well, before we turn to uh, questions from the audience, let let let's discover what um, the absence of, of truth claims or making judgments what that means in other areas of life. So you, you've written uh, that in art and architecture, whereas maybe in art the, the original idea was to try to, uh, to point the, the viewer of, of that sculpture or that painting towards some sort of higher plane and mm. toward a closer realization of, of some sort of truth. Uh, and, and in architecture, of course, the, the, the main idea was to create uh, structures uh, that were to be inhabitable for, for humans uh, to, to live or to, or, or to work in. Uh, has that changed? No. Uh, uh, it's much more difficult to, to defend some kind of objective aesthetics than it is to defend an objective morality. In the end, once you've, once you've stated the questions of morality clearly, an awful lot of it is plain common sense, as the name of your society um, commemorates. But plain common sense about art is quite difficult to obtain. Uh, um, in fact, it seems to me it's architecture is the only very only clear example in which people do spontaneously agree with each other. Uh, everybody, that is to say, except architects. Uh, and that's because architects make money out of it. And, and I think you will find that it's certainly in the European context, there is... Uh, uh, you know, a natural tendency to to accept certain forms uh, and to reject others, except those f uh, except forms which give the air of a settlement. 
right. a place where you can be at home. Uh, and that, because architecture is touching on something which is deeper than aesthetics, which right. is our need to settle together as communities. Uh, and from that need follow things like the shapes of windows, the shapes of roofs, the heights of buildings. Right. And even things like, like details, you know, shadows. You can't live in a building. You can't look at a building which doesn't have shadows. Right. There's one over there which has none. Um, which uh, is kind of glazed monstrosity, like a big eye looking at the people of Budapest and defying them. You know, it's not, a, it's not something in the, shad in, the, in the vicinity of which you, can, you right. can actually feel at home. That's part of its purpose, because it's there to sell things, not to soothe people. Um, but I think in the sphere of architecture, you can draw on other things than the, the pure look of mm. buildings in order to uh, establish some kind of consensus. And it's very clear from the cities of Europe that that consensus has existed for at least 3,000 years. Uh, in a very broad sense, right. you know, um, the column and the architrave and the roof and the window, you know, these are standard right. things. When it comes to um, music and, uh, and painting, things look a little bit different. But still, uh, you know, the, uh, there's an expectation in most uh, morally alive people that art should not, um, as D.H. Lawrence puts it, do dirt on life. Mm. It shouldn't desecrate the ordinary expectations and the ordinary modes of fulfillment that people have. Uh, and, you know, obscenity, uh, uh, dis destructive violence, chaos, a th a thing, a works about that seem to celebrate the negative. Oh. For that reason, I think, uh, um, put people's teeth on edge and also give them a sense that, that a sense of sacrilege sometimes. Uh, and um, working out that idea is one thing that, to which I've devoted you know, some of my work. So uh, I have a few things to say about it. All right. Let's open it up for questions. I think... Um, <coughs> Uh, yes, the, 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 these u international human rights organizations are... The, the, part of the problem with them is that, as you imply, that the agenda has, has grown uncontrolled. So we don't, we don't really know whether there is a human right to social welfare. You know, is, is there a human right to a roof over your head? Um, or human right to health. It, it, what, would, what would settle the question? Nobody knows. Um, uh, so, you know, I can obviously claim that I have a human right as a red-haired pers person to special privileges when traveling in places like this where there are so few of them. Um, you know, and people do. But, it, but most people would laugh at it and say, no, that's ridiculous. But, they, but nevertheless, what are the grounds? Nobody knows. Uh, and that's a, so that, that, that is part of the problem. It's, there's an attempt to, to produce a kind of universal objective morality, but without any uh, conception of where it comes from. Uh, uh, the idea that people can't be judges in their own cause, of course, is, a, uh, is universally accepted, uh, only because everybody has an interest in their own cause other than its justice. You know, uh, the, the, the fundamental idea of natural justice, at least in English law, is that a dispute between two people must be adjudicated by a third person who has no interest in either side. If you have no interest in the matter, only justice can motivate your decision. That's the idea. It is problematic. They have political agendas uh, and all that, of course, and uh, they get taken over by people who have a, d a decided desire to reform 
whole societies. I mean, the European uh, Union, uh, the, well, the European Commission is very much characterized by this, because it is staffed by people who belong to essentially the, the um, transnational, rootless elite who don't actually have very many beliefs of a traditional kind um, and are extremely irritated by the spectacle of a place like Poland and a place like Hungary. I mean, there's lots to be irritated about, uh, about Hungary, uh, uh, no doubt. But, you know, um, the European Commission um, is the first to be irritated uh, and uh, will have reference to these, these, um, these vaguely defined human rights in order to make its position known. And that, um, that, of course, can produce enormous resentment. I mean, it has produced resentment in, in um, certainly in my country and in Poland, and it will go on doing so. OK, let me ask another question. You're, you're mm -hmm. talking about the EU. So in the European Parliament, I think not long ago, there was some, some sort of a decision made that uh, you, you couldn't use uh, g gender distinctive uh, terms uh, in the document. So no monsieur, uh, no madame, mm. no, no fraulein, uh, yeah. whatever else. Is, is this, uh, of course, we know there, there are now folks who think of uh, sort of different layers of gender. So you, you can be um, what, male bodied or female bodied, which is an uh, anatomical thing as opposed to uh, your identity, which would then be male or female. Mm. So, does this idea also originate in that gender is not something you can observe with a, a rational mind and sort of know what it is, but it, it really is about your, your, your identity, your judgment of yourself? Well, um, yes. This, this is a, another issue. Uh, it's very easy for these um, transnational institutions like the European Parliament to respond to pressure groups of, uh, of small organized people, uh, you know, obviously radical feminists uh, from France in this particular case. Uh, and um, those people probably wouldn't be able to force their, their uh, views upon the, the whole public of France through the normal democratic process, because then they would come up against the fact that the French people don't want to Right. to lose Monsieur, Madame, Mademoiselle, and so on. Right. Um, and um, this is one way in which elites impose their views on majorities by using uh, these roundabout transnational institutions. Although in America, the, the elites use the Supreme Court in the same way to, right. to bypass ordinary people's feelings. This has been obvious in the case of abortion. Um, that, uh, that the uh, standard New York liberal position on abortion was made into a nationwide, um, a nationwide orthodoxy through the Supreme Court. Mm. Uh, OK, it, it's moving back the other way, but, but um, that's, that's something I, that just does happen. Uh, and um, many people say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, what does it matter whether we drop the word monsieur, or mademoiselle, or whatever? But um, it's a bit like what happened in Turkey in, um, in 1919, 1922, I think, when Ataturk said the Turkish language must no longer be written mm. in Arabic script. It's got to be written in the Latin alphabet. Um, then then it, that's much more sensible and straightforward, and then it'd be much easier to... to, to people to learn it from the Western countries and we could relate to Western countries much more easily. And it had a fantastic effect. It changed Turkish society uh, in, a, in a radical way, but it cut Turks off completely from their literary past. Mm. You know, the, um, nobody in Turkey today can read any of the classics, mm. except a few you know, for highly educated people. Maybe that doesn't matter because the classics weren't any good. But um, I don't think that is true. Right. Um, uh, uh, but in a similar way, but not less severely, American feminism, which is insisting on the, uh, the feminine pronoun, is cutting off many people from the natural sense of the rhythm of, of English mm -hmm. as used by those um, 
you know, uh, reactionary writers like Hume yeah. and, uh, and Burke yeah. and, and even John Stuart Mill. That's a very good point. Uh, um, I think, I don't think I've succeeded in defining moral relativism because I think it's so elusive a thing. One might say that, that a certain kind of conservatism which says that, that custom has a validity of its own, which is what you're saying, is um, very appealing. But it isn't a, a form of relativism because it is actually uh, validating custom as such. It's saying, you know, custom does have a value and it's, that's the way we look for the solutions. And these solutions have emerged from people's interaction over generations, and that's why we should respect them. This is something that Burke said in his Reflections on the French Revolution, and really he was speaking about a, a very objective moral truth, you know, that, that the answers to, moral, to social questions are not invented but discovered, and they're discovered over time through the people's interaction. But of course, different people perhaps don't discover them and maybe have bad customs. Yeah, there are. So when, when, when mm. for example, uh, and, and, and noticing these differences among peoples is, I guess, as old as history, because Her Herodotus famously noted uh, differences in some of the African tribes and, and in Eurasia. Um, so how do, you, how do you then treat different customs if you recognize them to be some, somewhat morally yeah. This is different. what the Enlightenment wanted to do, was to, as I said, uh, to find that position outside specific customs from which right. they could all be judged. And, that's, uh, and the universal do doctrine of human rights was supposed to be that position. Uh, and my view is that perhaps it is, as long as rights are treated in this purely negative way mm -hmm. that the American founders treated them and as Kant treated them and, and really as Aquinas treated them. <laughs> but when, when the doctrine of human rights starts escalating without any grounds, then all you're doing is imposing a, a, a new elite morality mm -hmm. on people who, who can't possibly accept it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, there are problems. As we know, you know, most of us feel that there are aspects of many of the um, Muslim societies that, uh, that we are becoming familiar with these days, which we can't accept. You know, forced marriage, honor killing, even perhaps the constant concealing of women. You know, we've, to us, that, that, that is repugnant. But, um, you know, uh, um, there is a question in many people's minds, if you then just impose the Enlightenment liberal morality on this, these communities, are you doing them a, a service or not? Right. You know, uh, uh, there is a real, a real conflict here, a conflict of values. But, but of course, some of our customs, they probably also think are repugnant. Yes. So then, uh, what, what are we to do? Well, the answer was that, um, you know, to um, send them back home, but you can't say that. <laughs> um, you have to say, no, we've got to live together as communities. Mm. Uh, uh, and they are right to be repelled by, you know, uh, pornography and all these things that they're repelled by mm. in our communities. Um, and we're right to be repelled by, by their treatment of, of women. Right. Uh, and an accommodation over time might improve both of us. Right. And on the same topic, in England, is the acceptance of certain forms of uh, Sharia law within the, uh, the British legal system, is that sort of a natural outgrowth of, of our uh, wanting to treat their understanding of justice as similar or as equal to ours and as somehow compatible even in the same, same nation? Uh, no, because um, our, our nation is founded upon the rule of law, uh, and, uh, uh, and this law has always been secular, uh, and it's it, uh, it, what the law is is settled by Parliament and by the courts in obedience to Parliament. 
Uh, so um, to, to say that there should be a Sharia law adjudicated in parallel is effectively to deny that there is a unified nation. Uh, the Ottoman Empire lasted in this way quite for a long time, saying that, you, you know, uh, that family affairs are adjudicated by um, Sharia uh, if, it's the, uh, if, if the family is Sunni Muslim or by the um, uh, uh, ca canon law of the Catholic Church if they're Maronite and so on, uh, uh, and um, the orthodox jurisdiction of Constantinople for the, those, or well, uh, Athens, I think, guess, for the um, Greek Catholic and so on. Uh, uh, and they, did, they managed it, mm -hmm. but they managed it only because there were no nations. Mm -hmm. It was an, an empire without borders. We have the view that um, the ultimate source of authority is the nation state defined by its borders. Um, and uh, within those borders, the law, the secular law as determined by Parliament, is the final authority. It's, that's not just an arbitrary thing that, for us, that is the foundation of our uh, obedience. And if a community grows up within those borders not accepting that, then it doesn't belong within those borders. That's, and, and there's no other solution. So by, by endorsing parallel uh, legal systems, then they are in, in fact rejecting mm. the relation state. That's yeah. exactly right. Okay. It doesn't follow from the fact that our obedience is to the rule of law that the law can just be anything. There are there are internal constraints. Not only the constraints of democratic election to Parliament, but the constraints of constitutions and of procedures embedded within the law. And the problem with Carl Schmitt, one of the many problems with Carl Schmitt, <laughs> was that, that he had yes, but he had this kind of extremism. Uh, 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 of the time, you know, of those terrible years between the wars, where he just wanted to, you know, to put a guillotine through everything. He said, at a certain stage, it stops, you know, uh, and uh, and he says, he, who is he is leader, who has the voice in uh, in the cri the final voice in a crisis. You know, that's uh, the, for him, the crisis is what settles who is uh, um, who is in authority, and we English always had, had the opposite view. In a crisis, uh, um, that's when you should look for, uh, for the authority that has come about in peacetime. You know, a cri it's not the crisis that settles who is in authority, but the normal peaceful uh, dealings between people when there is no crisis. Uh, 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 and the whole purpose of politics is to avoid crises. Uh, and on the whole, we English do avoid them very well. It's why we seem so complacent. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's the same as true here. You know that um, that if you look back on uh, people like Kelsen and so on, and the Austro-Hungarian tradition, although it's very different from the English, it is talking about the normal uh, way of dealing with things and not the crisis. As I understand it, the, the Enlightenment conception of, well, there's no one Enlightenment right. conception, but uh, uh, the Enlightenment conception that the American Constitution embodies uh, uh, tries to, to um, put, set the, the state up as the, <clears throat> the, the, the thing which settles disputes. Now, the, thing, the thing which maintains the ongoing peaceable communion of people um, and represents their interests in the world as a whole, which means it doesn't in itself dictate to them all the uh, um, axioms which they will need for day-to-day -day living. There is also a, a whole sphere of, of human life in which morality and religion play their part, but those those 
um, spheres are not in themselves the sphere of the political. So there's a separation of the political sphere from the, from the moral and certainly from the religious, That's obviously famously so in the American case. It doesn't mean that the state doesn't in some oblique way depend on, uh, on those spheres, that, that if people become completely demoralized uh, uh, and completely um, lose all religious sense, then of course it could be that the state also suffers um, you know, from it, it, that it's no longer able really to rely upon on customs that it needed to rely upon in order to function. And I think that might be true. Uh, humour is very important, <laughs> um, and uh, also s satire of the opponent. You know, and uh, uh, it's very difficult because, um, as I was saying earlier, moral relativism has a tendency quickly to become a kind of absolutism of its own. You know, so that if you're making judgments or if you are revealing that you have some source of values which you regard as sacred or holy or outside this, you know, just personal choice, then, then people do start abusing you, uh, and that's, uh, that's undeniably true. But um, in, in the long run, you know, uh, you, you can stand up to that, uh, and things, things change. People, people might abuse you for a, as a fascist or whatever for, for 10 years, but uh, you know, when the, the results of their worldview are being felt all around, around them, they might come back to seeing, you know, she was right all along. You know, and that, that, uh, that's, that, I mean, to a very small extent, I've had this experience. I, I, I was, um, when I started coming out, um, as a conservative, in the, about, around about 1980, uh, it was to the immense shock of the academic establishment, and there were lots of. I had to sue people to, uh, you know, to um, for libel for things that were said. In, um, and there was a BBC program uh, with the sound of marching jackboots behind, uh, you know, somebody commenting on my on something I've written. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that every, everything was done to make it look as though uh, this was the, big, the, the, the thin end of the fascist wedge. And um, uh, for a long time I was very disheartened by it, uh, uh, you know, uh, and you can feel very, very distressed. But uh, things have changed now, uh, and um, you know, a great many people think that, that po possibly I wasn't just totally wrong about everything. Uh, and a certain habilitation, rehabilitation comes about. Uh, you know, I, 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 um, there was, I, I was sort of kept out of the British Academy, for instance, by all the old left establishment, um, Volheim and Williams and Isaiah Berlin and all that crowd. And then, you know, they, they all died. Uh, I, I, um, I have to say, I was out of the country at the time, had nothing to do with it, they just died. Um, and uh, the next week I was ma made a fellow of the British Academy, you know. So that was a sure sign that perhaps things do change. That certainly is true. Uh, um, obviously, it, that we, we, I mean, we all have plenty of examples. Uh, if, like, just basic human relations, uh, families have, are differently constituted, and um, uh, and yet can live side by side, although. You, ha you know, still there might be a question of whether you have to be tolerant in, f in order for this to happen. And uh, toleration means perhaps accepting that it isn't 
that you know, your neighbor isn't living in the right way, but nevertheless, it's not for you. You have no right to interfere. And that's the very normal uh, um, position to take, I suspect, in, in Western societies. And um, we don't go through life thinking that every question is to be settled by a moral absolute. Uh, I mean, we are negotiating creatures, and that's especially true of, of us Europeans, because our, our systems of law emerge from negotiation. They're not, they're not dictated from on high by God, um, unlike the, the Sharia. Uh, they, they, are, um, they are the results of, of discussions over many hundreds of years, even in the English case, a thousand years. So we, we're used to the idea that, um, that we don't settle all our questions by moral absolutes. But still, we might need some of those absolutes in order to begin. Yeah. It, it, it seems to me that maybe the, maybe the worst uh, outcome uh, for a society that, that completely embraces moral relativism is just a reassertion of the idea that might is right and, mm. and sort of power politics. Do you agree with that, or is there a worse well, outcome? Th there is, um, this is a uh, quite interesting point. I I in the 1960s, um, you know, when the, uh, I wouldn't say the fall of man began then, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, things did change right. um, in a radical way. Right. Uh, very popular at the time, uh, it was not just the, the relativistic morality of, um, of the, uh, you know, the student revolution, but the philosophy that, that, um, that rewrote morality as a system of power. Right. And this is uh, obviously Foucault was the, the most important person in this. Uh, and the, the, the basic argument in Foucault's writings, and they, it's an argument which comes ultimately from Marx, is that um, moral judgments have no intrinsic validity. Uh, they, they are a part of ideology which, um, whose reality has to be understood in terms of the power relations that they vindicate or endorse. To, to know what is being said by a moral judgment, you must go behind it yeah. to discover the relations of power which are being um, concealed by it. Right. and made to look legitimate. Uh, and um, once you think like that, uh, you, you think that you have an absolute right to overthrow those relations of power mm -hmm. because they, they have no ground other than themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and with them overthrow the morality that goes with them. In um, Foucault's four-volume Histoire de la Sexualité, um, which I'm sure some of you know, you, you discover what this all at work, you know, this overthrowing of every possible system of sexual morality as a mere legitimization of power relations, uh, which um, in particular historical contexts. And um, that's been very influential, of course, on adolescent, uh, on the sexual behavior of half-educated adolescents, mm -hmm. um, not fully educated or completely uneducated, but the, the, the ones in between. Uh, uh, and uh, Foucault, of course, is, is a very important thinker in that he's sort of made the postmodern world through this kind of way of thinking. Well, I, I understand the problem uh, um, because obviously. It's being talked about everywhere, uh, 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 and in particular the, um, the Hungarian situation. Uh, <clears throat> my, my view is that one, one should not look for political si solutions to this, the, pro the problem that we've been discussing today. We're, we're, we're talking about something that goes to the heart of personal life and personal relations. Um, we are, it's as though the... the the, um, the, the Enlightenment has finally come home to us, you know, uh, and what it means to us. Uh, and we, 
many people feel you know, that, that there's an urgent need, a worldwide need, to find some other foundation for uh, um, the moral life than religion. Now, I, um, it, I'm skeptical that there really can be that other foundation, but certainly it can't be politics. One of the problems with communism is that it did try to provide an alternative foundation, not just for political order, but for the moral life, uh, and to recruit everybody to a, a kind of militarized equality, which people have rejected, uh, um, because they've seen that it, it disenchanted human uh, society completely left people demoralized uh, and in, in opposition to each other about everything. Uh, um, harmony can, can come about, however, not through politics. It can only come about because people uh, recognize the, the, the value of their own life and the value of the life of those around them. And that's something that has to be created through their own efforts. Uh, in America, a book called uh, the, the Closing of the American Mind, um, the author talks about some of the effects of, of what you had mentioned, the, the, the pessimism and the, and the skepticism, uh, the, the dismissal of truth claims that, that came out of the 1960s. And he talks about it in, in, in the context of the university, uh, such that, that students uh, don't inquire after knowledge or, or, or uh, seek after truth anymore. Uh, and, and he made a, a rather outrageous statement that he, he saw that as being somehow a worse situation uh, than even the, the maybe religious wars that were happening uh, yes. in, in Europe. It, do you think that's a little far-fetched, or is he trying to get at something um, that, that, you know, possibly embracing that, that sort of moral relativism and it eroding the foundations of justice or as laws we talked about previously uh, in, the, in the case of Britain? It has some, some, somehow a, a, a deadly effect on civilization in, in the long run. Yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, there is a, a tendency of people in, in universities to, um, to think that what's going on in the university is what really matters. And that was the case with Bloom. Uh, uh, when, he's when he was talking about the closing of the American mind, he really meant the fact that he couldn't talk to his students anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and outside the universities, there are all kinds of natural, normal Americans still existing, uh, going about their business, uh, going to church services. You know, America has remained a, 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 devoted, a devout Christian society through all these things, at least if you're outside the cities. Uh, and also, if you're outside the universities, a basically decent society. So, so, um, so the fact is that it, it, it wasn't as bad as he thought. Right. Um, it was just bad for him. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but he had a point <clears throat> because what he was saying was that, uh, that the relativism had made it impossible for him to teach the, the curriculum as though it had any objective authority. That was really what upset him. You know, you couldn't say to, to the student, look, uh, you know, um, here is Shakespeare, uh, and um, just look. And here is Steinbeck. You know, um, just look. Surely you've got to see that that first thing is is not just better, but but touching on the human reality in a right. deeper way. And the students will say, "That's your your view." You know, I've got my Bob Dylan, uh, you know, uh, uh, and which is you know a million times better than what they have now, uh, and. Um, you, you know, there is a problem if you can't discuss, if you can't teach the old curriculum in the humanities uh, because of this relativism. What are you going to teach students? Right. Uh, and um, increasingly, um, people teach pseudosciences instead. You know, the, uh, the deconstructionist analysis of, of Steinbeck or. Um, or instead of teaching aesthetics, neuroaesthetics, you know, uh, um, not knowing quite what that is. It's, uh, it, you know, it's Beethoven plus brain scans. Well, is after all moral relativism that big of a problem? If it only amounts to maybe differences of opinions and occasional renegotiating of the, uh, the political structure, is it, is it really that big of a problem? I would say that, um, that we have to be much more 
careful of our institutions than moral relativists tend to be. Um, our values as Europeans come about through long-standing institutions. Here, as the gentleman said at the back, you know, communism destroyed the institutional superstructure, uh, and, but it needs to be rebuilt. Uh, and um, the, the, the example of Bloom and the closing of the American mind, I think, is significant because it has become difficult to maintain the dignity of the university mm. in, in the times in which we live. Churches have find it extremely difficult to maintain their teaching when uh, when anything goes uh, and um, uh, you know a traditional marriage upon which the reproduction of society depends as we all know is under threat throughout the Western world as uh, you know uh, some supposedly arbitrary um, agreement between two adults to share each other's, or, or Kant said, a contract for the mutual use of the sexual organs. You know, uh, Kant's view, uh, uh, Kant was obviously quite repelled by marriage, as you can imagine, <laughs> but, um, uh, but uh, it, it, that's the view that he's prevailing. Uh, and yeah. of course, it, it leaves children out of consideration. Once you've left children out of consideration, things have come to an end. Right. They haven't yet, though. I've got two. Don't leave us on uh, quite yeah. such a pessimistic yeah. note. So yeah. there is hope. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking Roger Scruton. <laughs>